Thank you everyone for being here. The, um, if you're at and waiting for the APTA uh, Facebook Live, we appreciate it. We appreciate the support and for you waiting around for it. There were some technical difficulties, so clearly we didn't actually do it live, but what we did was we uh, recorded it offline and we'll post that later on today or the APTA will post it and there's a lot of good stuff in there. So make sure you check that out. So just a little bit about the uh, session. So as you know, we'll have a discussion about what's happening in terms of physiotherapy and rehab in terms of COVID-19 in Canada and around the globe. And we'll start with, we start with the sit rep. And then today we have an amazing uh, physical therapist, or I was just in the States. Can you tell? I was doing a talk there. We have an amazing physiotherapist uh, who's been doing some really great stuff in Canada. So I uh, will welcome her on as well, but I'll pass over to Mike to do a, a situation report. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> so, um, and by the way, we're going to start posting these, um, these details. Well, we've already started, we already have been posting these. So I'll just read some of the, again, the new numbers, the, the curve, we've not come close to the peak in terms of new infections or, or casualties. So the the global number is uh, 416,686 affected, um, 18,589,000 uh, deaths, and up to now 197 countries that have been uh, affected. I'll make a small comment as usual along here, but the first is, so I was speaking with a, a PT in uh, Afghanistan, or Iraq this morning, She's in Kurdistan province, so or the Kurdistan area of Iraq, and she was mentioning that Iraq actually, at least in her area, is managing the outbreaks pretty well. Uh, they have a fair amount of experience in quarantining and isolation and really uh, figuring this out. So unlike us, who've um, you know really struggled with things like quarantining and social isolation, it's um, other countries have. Um, you know, at least up to this point, anecdotally done uh, better than maybe have been expected. Uh, some, so other than the data, the numbers, and, and again, we'll, we'll encourage you to go to the Canada Public Health Agency for Canadian numbers. Um, they're not good. Uh, we see an, an increase in the number of deaths um, that are, are far to be, un that are almost un un unexpected at that rate. Uh, some new information, though, that um, recently came out is that um, the, the coronavirus now is affecting the olfactory nerves, so being able to uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. And so one of the new symptoms at uh, triage centers is uh, loss of smell and taste. And so these become data that are newly formed. Uh, a lot of the data, the published data that we have now is really coming from the Chinese uh, experience and, and soon, I'm sure, uh, the Italian experience and, and moving. This is moving, as you know, very quickly. JAMA Cardiology published, I think it was today, that about uh, close to 20%, or 19.7% of those who were treated have long-lasting uh, cardiac injury following uh, survivorship. So Again, when we start thinking of, uh, mentioned at the last time, AR arts and sort of uh, pulmonary scarring potentially, but we're thinking now um, there's multiple systems that are being involved, <clears throat> which is a little different, by the way, than SARS was in terms of its affection of high or low respiratory. And, and, uh, but at any rate, now we're seeing um, uh, cardiac involvement. Um, New York City today, uh, really, it was, uh, it was quite a tragic event. Um, uh, I'll let you kind of look up some of the media on this, but they've had some of the single highest day of uh, casualties. Um, there is a news feed. I'll encourage any one of you who might be interested. It's from Johns Hopkins. It's not about the U.S. It's just in Johns Hopkins. It's called, it's called Global Health Now. So if you were to Google Johns Hopkins Global Health Now, you'll get to this website and you can sign up for daily messaging. And it's really fantastic. And obviously it's focused a lot now on, uh, on COVID-19. Uh, but the report today was, was pretty stark in terms of um, the, the, the numbers. In fact, the governor of, of, New, of New York has forced all of the New York City hospitals to reduce their capacity immediately, get rid of every patient that is non-emergency in order to build more capacity for the surge. Today wasn't the surge. There's an incremental movement. And, 
I think I may, we may have talked about it last time, but we now have an equal number of community transmissions around the world and countries than we had from travel uh, transmission. And so these community-based uh, transmissions are often unidentified. Um, I am glad to see, and both Phil and I are glad to see the, the, May, the uh, movement around, uh, around Canada in terms of uh, isolation, because once the theory is once you see such a high amount of uh, community transmission, the only way to stop this is to isolate. And then once you isolate, you identify, you treat, and you stop it. So from an epi perspective, that's, that's kind of where it is. You, you may have also seen you know, just a couple more points and we'll move on, but um, uh, the feds uh, have passed the bill that we talked about last time after uh, an all night session offering uh, a fair amount of, uh, I think is 80 some odd billion dollars in recovery uh to canadians um it, it it sort of the the liberals in power had to remove some of the uh, clauses in there around unilateral and timing unilateral use of the money and timing uh, but i am glad within 24 hours it did get passed and, and moved along this should bring in some um some important outcomes for uh for canadians around uh, everywhere um, so I'll, I'll kind of stop there. That's sort of what seems to be happening. Um, and the next time we meet, I'll probably, before we do this, I'm going to post something uh, on Phil's website that will be migrated into our new website so that we don't have to spend a whole lot of time. But I'll, I'll probably pick three of the major points and just highlight them uh, and how they might be relevant to, uh, to PTs in Canada as we move forward. Um, so, so Phil, I'm going to stop there and pass it over to you, or should I just go ahead and introduce Andy? Sure, sure, yeah. Well, so everyone, listen, let me, let me introduce you to just uh, one of the most amazing physios, I think. So Sandy Brennan um, is in private practice there in, uh, in Canada, just outside of Ottawa. And uh, has uh, we had a quick discussion through uh, through a mutual friend not too long ago that uh, where I, I learned of this interactive um, event that's happening in her clinic, which really is around treating urgent uh, using an urgent care approach uh, as a physiotherapist to treat patients in ways that they won't bog down the the healthcare system and start planning for the long-term survivorship for most people uh, around the country so i will just say uh sandy's from montreal and and, and now in canada but l let me pass the floor over to you sandy for like maybe a five minute review of what who you are and what your clinic has been doing and then uh no doubt there'll be some great questions and thank you for joining us uh so i've been over to you i've been practiced for 29 years and in private practice for the last 20 I was in the hospital before that and work in a, a relatively small clinic in Canada um, and the clinic owner probably about two and a half weeks, three weeks ago started, uh, we were following very close to the COVID-19, uh, the recommendations, what we should be doing and started making changes in our clinic at that time, um, taking out things that would maybe uh, be contact magazines, that sort of thing. That was our first steps. Then we started um, contacting our patients. Uh, and saying, you know, do you need to come in, uh, triaging out what those patients really needed it, patients that we were maybe concerned about bringing in. Um, we do a mostly orthopedic based clinic. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have six private rooms. So our patients are actually individually put into a private room, which is very great to work with. Um, and we uh, treat a variety of people. We treat from right down to young kids, right up to uh, senior citizens in their 90s. We have a, a long-term care unit that's right beside us. So often the more functional ones will walk over and see us when they need us. Um, and that's where we started our whole, uh, our whole adventure on this uh, COVID-19 about three and a half, about three weeks ago or so. So thank you, Sandy. So walk us through how it is now, sort of from, from patient do they just arrive or do they call in you do pre so walk us through maybe step by step how they actually get to meeting yes. to you touching them yeah yeah so started um more than uh we were fortunate we worked right beside a medical clinic and uh last week the medical clinic actually closed their waiting room and we started screening patients um before they even were coming in we were reaching out to them by email by phone talking to them and saying, you know, have you been out of the country in the last 14 days? Have you been exposed to anybody who's, who's been ill? How are you feeling yourself? Um, making sure that they're well. And then the nurses in the unit next to us were actually screening them as they walked in the door. So everybody was being screened. They were asked to wash their hands before walking in and then brought into the clinic. 
but as of uh, this Monday, we actually um, have closed the clinic completely following uh, the recommendations and are only seeing our urgent care patients. So all of our own patients, we have contacted individually, um, whether that by email or by phone call, can we help you? How are you feeling? Is there anything urgent that you need? Patients are calling into the clinic and then either one of the physios in the clinic is calling them back and screening whether or not they fall into that category of urgent care or if they're post-op. We've had a few post-op patients that uh, have just had surgery that should be followed up in hospital. Obviously, that's no longer a possibility, so they are coming into the clinic. Again, they're being screened before they walk into the clinic on the phone. They're being screened as they walk in. And the other thing we're doing is screening ourselves to every patient as they come in, uh, encourage, uh, telling them that we have not left the country in the last 14 days, that we're healthy, and we have not been exposed as far as we are aware to anybody that's been ill. So making sure that we have consent before we get started. And uh, then we are treating, um, we have a full disinfection program going on. We're trying to really space out our schedule. There's only one physio in there at a time and uh, leaving lots of space between patients so that patients are not getting stuck beside people in waiting rooms. They really are brought into the clinic, brought right into the room, treated and then uh, taken back out again. Um, the main clinic door is actually locked, so they have to actually be let in by somebody. They cannot just walk into a clinic right now. There was um, a more detailed uh, list came out just at the early part of this week. Prior to that, we were using um, a couple of the physios, the clinic owner and myself, sat down and kind of looked at which patients we really felt would need to be treated and which ones would end up back and emerge if we didn't treat them. Um, the types of people that we're seeing coming through are the people working in HR who are working super long hours right now trying to keep their, their businesses going and uh, keeping their staff safe, policy workers who are changing policies all the time because policy is changing and they're working long hours. These patients that would end up developing musculoskeletal problems that could end, land them in eMERGE with acute pain or land them in their family practice, uh, in their family doctor's offices as well, which are already overwhelmed with people who are ill. So trying to prevent them from having to do that. And then when they have come into us, we reach back out to the family doctor and say, I saw your patient today. This is what we did. This is how we're doing. Um, if you have any other concerns, please get back to us. And then that doctor can then screen out and if they need medication or whatever they've been able to do. So we really try to connect with the doctors in the community as well as um, and other patients calling in. But we definitely screen for those that are in an emergency situation. If they don't see someone sitting in an emergency room, which we don't want, or sitting in a family doctor's office, a lot of them are also patients we know, so we kind of have an idea of how they're going to develop. And when they do call in in pain, we kind of know that these are patients that could end up in an emergency situation. So we're trying to prevent that as well. So we've been following the guidelines that, um, that our patients are not symptomatic and have not traveled. So we're using the, trying to keep our distance as much as we can. We're using gloves when it's appropriate. We're, tr um, we don't have face masks on, but our patients are asymptomatic at this time. And as far as we can tell, we're following the guidelines that have been provided to us right now. Then we have a whole disinfection process that goes on. Um, machines, everything's wiped down. We're not touching anything that belongs to patients. Everything in the room is wiped down. And then the next patient is brought in. So we're trying to keep it as um, disinfected and minimize touch as much as we can. 
what have the what have the patients what has been their perspective on this, Sandy? So, um, you know, maybe give us a little bit of insight from their their viewpoint. I mean, surely they are appreciative, but what are the concerns they might have? Uh, and, and I'm thinking even through your discussion with the long-term care facility sort of downstream, Bill and I have been making this argument around um, this important to address obviously the acute needs right now, but as we move forward in time that there will be a fairly large cohort of, you know, people who, who may be just sub-urgent care that, you know, will you know, will develop other mobility or disability related outcomes. So yeah, give us a little flavor from the patients you've been treating. What are they telling you? So our patients have been responding that they're the ones that we brought in. And honestly, most of our stuff is happening uh, by a computer, like talking and stuff. We're not bringing everybody in. I see three patients maybe in a day. Um, the patients are extremely appreciative to have the opportunity to come in and be seen. Um, as I said, uh, one of my patients is a policy advisor for a very large company here in Ottawa. She is changing her policies every day and it's the stuff that she does affects uh, Canadians all across the country. Um, I have a patient care assistant and a nurse um, from one of the hospitals. She's desperate to get back to work. She injured herself because she's been doing extra work at home and extra work at, uh, at the hospital currently. Um, she is not on a COVID-19 floor so her, uh, her risks were low which is why she was safe to come in. Um, the patients are just happy not to have to go, that they know they're going to end up in, these patients often know they're going to end up in emerge if they don't see someone or going to have to go and sit in a family doctor's office. So they're very appreciative of the fact that they get to come in and actually get treatment. And then they're starting to feel better. They're moving and they're moving on, which is what we were looking for. Let me read, thank you. Let me read you a question from Jenny Day on the chat. Uh, what are you using on the beds? Are you changing pillows every time, using paper overtop? What's the we've been changing bet? We've been changing all our pillows. We limited our pillows in our rooms to just three. We change every pillow every time, and we're using a mixture. It's a, a combination. We usually use an organic type of um, a solution on the bed, but now we're using a bleach and water solution. So you can smell the disinfectant as you're walking in the room, it's quite strong. Um, we're wiping down all the chairs, we're wiping down all the surfaces, all the machines the light switches and the door handles before the next patient enters the room. So uh, making sure that as many surfaces as we can are wiped down prior to them coming in. And not using any pillow, like no extra, um, like we have wedges and stuff for knees. We've taken all of those out of the clinic. Uh, we've taken all our TheraBands out of the clinic. Um, if we cut a piece of TheraBand, it goes home with the patient that sort of thing to minimize anything. And we don't have any weights or anything like that in our clinic. It's not a clinic that as a big weight gym area, it is really individual patient uh, treatment. So there's not, um, there's no big gym space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. How about we, maybe we'll just open up for some uh, questions here, if that's okay. Uh, Kyle, I see you just put something there. Maybe just unmute and go for it if, uh, if you can. Yeah, um, I just had a uh, question just written there. Just wondering if you're running through the same, sorry guys, just had a kid run in. I'm um, just run, wondering if you're running through the, uh, the same room repeatedly or if you're sort of running sort of down, like you see a patient in uh, room A, wipe it down, go to room B, just allow for, like I'm not sure if uh, air exchange needs to be done between that or just like just self-ventilation of the room or if you're just going through repeated rooms or so we're trying to minimize actually how many times we go back and forth between rooms so once a patient is in a room trying to get them treated and get them out then the room can be cleaned and we can be in a different room at the after that one is done so that we're not going back and forth all the time because every time you go out you have to clean everything off clean yourself off and then go back into the next room so we're trying to minimize that sort of back and forth between rooms um, spreading our schedule out. as i said we've only seen a couple of like you know three four patients at most in a day so we can spread that we're not having to run okay. in and out of like the same room multiple times Excellent. because it does get it does get complex like every time you open the door yeah. you walk in you walk out you have to walk like you're washing all the time um so it's easier just to have one patient focus on them get them out and then bring the next one and that's what we've i've kind of learned over the last 
I'm going to say seven or eight days is that it's easier just to have, and I actually split my schedule a little bit more to like over the last three days, just because I found it was too much going in and out of rooms. Yeah, certainly. Fair enough. So. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Um, let's open it up. Anyone else have any uh, questions? I mean, I have one, but I, I'd love to hear what you, you, you all have to say. I have one too, but we'll see if, or if anyone else is thinking about doing this, has been doing it, or what are some of the considerations that you're going through to um, actually start? Because I know this is a conversation that's happening around Canada. Maybe I'll jump in. Hi, Sandy, it's Diana again. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether your clinic, anybody at your clinic or yourself are members of the private practice division of uh, CPA? My, my, the clinic owner is. And, and uh, are you finding that, you know, they're, they've been very aggressive at being really good at helping with how do you do tele-rehab, how do we do things on site, all the questions that are being asked here. Um, are you finding that there's answers there for you folks? Yeah, Colleen has been, we just had this discussion today about the telehealth. She's been wondering, she's been watching a few of the different webinars. And uh, was gonna, we were going to sit down tomorrow, actually, and chat through some of them. And uh, we're, we've used, we use Jane at our clinic, so we're going to be going on their telehealth uh, seminar on tomorrow at 4.30. And uh, yes, Colleen has found that the private practice uh, information has been excellent. And we actually were listening to some of their stuff when we were trying to decide whether we were going to close completely on Saturday. We were up and down with decisions on, you know, do we just close the clinic altogether and not bring anybody in, or do we continue to serve those emergency patients? And uh, we had been listening. She had been uh, in contact with some people from private practice time as well. Yeah. And maybe another question, if, if which is great. This is great. Um, if uh, you're seeing folks and you're not masking up, and we're assuming that there's a percentage of the population who don't show any signs or symptoms but are positive, um, is that worrisome to your crowd? as in the physios that are that are doing this? Uh, the patient, the physios that are doing it are quite comfortable with the situation as we have it right now. Um, I think we are, we're taking it hour by hour. You know, things are changing all the time. Policies are changing all the time and we're following very closely. And if it changes, then we have to start, you know, the suggestion is that we mask with every single patient, then that will be the next step that we bring into, uh, into effect for sure. There isn't a lot of clinic physios in the clinic. There's only two or three of us. There's only two of us treating right now. Um, many of the physios have, for many reasons, are not treating right now. We don't have, a, as I said, most of it is happening online or by phone calls. So we're not bringing a lot of people in at this stage. But more just I, keep in touch. I have to say that I'm, you know, 100% in favor of us seeing, talking to and tele-rehab or somehow interacting with our patients as much as we can during this time. Absolutely. I think that just knowing that somebody's there to listen and if they have any concerns, they can reach out. And that's the message we've said to our patients. You know, we've tried to reach out. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Are your exercises going okay? Just to keep that line of communication open so they don't feel like they've all of a sudden been stranded in the community. Um, and that seems to be working quite well so far. And patients are reaching out and they are... Uh, looking like looking for answers and stuff and and very reasonable about when to come in you know the majority of them like you know what i'm feeling pretty good i think i'm okay to stay out fantastic then i'll come in so we've been very lucky great have the, sandy have the patients been um is it mostly patient requests or have other referral sources called up and said hey sandy you know this patient um or or you know is it just self-referral at this point in terms of those urgent cases or are you getting something else most of the ones that we're treating urgently are ones that we already had on our caseload. So the people that have come in, we've had a few patients call in who were looking for physios that were still open because they had just had surgery, total knees, total hips, and they were looking to come in and be treated. Um, those were the kind of ones that, that have called into us. Um, we've had a couple of patients that urgently, um, you know, thoracic dysfunctions where they can barely breathe, they're up all night, and their next step is, I'm going to end up in my doctor's office or emerge, I'm really sore. Can I come in? It, probably have, because I'm in a smaller area, I probably have a history with the clinic before they come in, which also helps because then it gets easy for us to, to screen them and bring them in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
I don't want to bogart the conversation here, but uh, anyone else have a question? I'll jump in if that's okay. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. A quick question. Um, you mentioned that uh, you were contemplating perhaps uh, closing the clinic and you weren't sure. Uh, can you speak to the factors that would uh, maybe push you to do so? I to closing that is? To closing, I think we're following the guidelines. And right now the guideline says that we're able to stay open and treat only emergency cases and those postoperative ones that will lose function or, you know, get into trouble if they're not treated. And so we're following those really carefully and we're not just bringing everybody in to treat for no reason. So um, that's what our, that's when we changed, that's when we directed our, our uh, focus to that group. And I think we'll keep following very carefully the guidelines that are being put out there. And, and if they change, then we will change our policy as well, following very carefully what they're saying, what the college says, what the association says, and what the Ministry of Health says. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, uh, the discussion points and, and questions. The, and I know it's, it's um, like in any disaster, it's kind of a everything's changing moment by moment. So I'm sure you're following things quickly. And, um, and it's good that we're starting to get some guidance and uh, guidelines from colleges and associations and that. Now, you did mention that you were, so part of the, the reason was to keep people out of family uh, physicians' offices and really help them deal with the either COVID-19 or the the skills and the cases that they should be working with. Have you spoken with any um, family doctors and what's kind of their perception of it and their views on it? Uh, so I have a few family doctors that have, because the patients who come in have been acute and they're, they've been in touch at least with their family doctor by uh, by a telephone call or, or, an, or a Skype or an email. And the patients have said, um, we have a pretty good relationship with most of the family doctors in our area. So the patients have said, uh, have asked that I, you know, send a note back to the family doctor about what's going on. And that's what the, or the family doctor has said, find out from Sandy what they think that we should do next. And so I email them back after I've seen the patient and say, this is what we've done so far. And then we've made decisions from there. I have another consult tomorrow with someone who needs to go back to work. And uh, I have to edit, it's going to go between myself and the family doctor as to whether we think she's ready to go back or not. And uh, again, she's in a very precarious situation. So we have to look at it carefully and see what's the best way for her to be back. So communication, I think, is really the key. We have to keep yeah. communicating with the family doctors, with our patients and, you know, with the public and just, you know, it takes a little bit more time. It's a lot more work for sure. Cause you know, you see the patient, you're doing your charts and then after that you do another, you know, note to a doctor or a call or whatever. So it's definitely a lot of time, but I think at this stage, it's the only way we're going to be able to move forward is to keep the communication lines open between them. So then they know we're out there to help them as much as we can. And the patients know that we're, we're out there helping them as well. So I think that's the, the one thing I can say is we have to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you're, that in everything you've been saying, it seems like your communication with everyone is, has really um, been a really good example of what we can do. Like in terms of even, even when you said communicating with patients um, to inform them about where you've been and your, like your self-screening and communicating yeah. that, but then with um, like family doctors as well. So that's one of the things I'm picking up a lot is that as, as everything's coming in, we really need to be communicating with everyone to make this um, feasible and and actually make it happen within our clinics so yeah that's yeah. really good so let me um, kind of give you a scenario there Sandy and and, uh, uh, and this comes to mind because again Phil and I were just on this other thing with the um, the APT yeah, the American PTs um, and Phil introduced this concept that he did in, in Nepal as an example of a step-down facility. So it's a little different because we're not talking infectious disease, but we are talking emergencies. So you, you'd have an acute care facility, a lot of people care, got to move in order to get more people throughput, et cetera. And so there was through the organization for, uh, International Organization for Migration, IOM, created us like a step down facility so patients were not yet ready to go back home but were 
were too well to stay in the acute care facility, you know what I mean? So they, were, they would go and the data was very solid and it made sense, it was good. Just thinking, let's say when the surge happens and you know, hopefully that's soon, and then we can go into a recovery phase, would your clinic be willing to accept as an example, or what, what would go through your mind building on Patrick's question around decision making? Like, let's say there were patients who had uh, who'd recovered from COVID and now we're ready for a rehab phase. Could a private practice in the community like yours act in that capacity of, yes, we can discharge this patient in the community, but they need rehab and we're going to call Sandy to get involved. How would you and your colleagues go through that process of doing that or not? Hmm, that's a tough one. I don't think it's one that we've discussed yet in our own clinic. Um, obviously, safety and safety for the other patients that are in the clinic and safety for the staff would be the, the main priority. Um, if it was deemed that this person was safe to be back in the community and it was a question of bringing them in for rehab, then I would say that would probably be something that we would go ahead and tackle. Um, that, that's, that's all I can really speak to at this stage in the game. I, I, I would always, you know, safety always being the first priority at this stage, right? Mm -hmm. Safe for us, safe for the other patients in the clinic. Yeah. We don't have access to, you know, some of the, you know, the personal protective equipment that may be necessary if the patient was still contagious, obviously. So we would never bring someone like that into our clinic. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't mm -hmm. be safe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, but I think, you know, these are the contingencies, these future projections that, you know, the CPA and everyone, we, we have to start thinking, okay, so, you know, there's going to be a surge and then there's going to be another, you know, post-recovery phase and how, how and where can we participate in that? Just like you said, to build trust, to continue the trust, to, and if you don't mind me saying, almost advocate for the profession into the future such that we, we uh, when this happens again, because around the world there's plenty of animal reservoirs of viruses, so when this happens again, we have a plan. Mm -hmm. ready Absolutely. to implement the plan as opposed to kind of making it up because and I'll just say like you know folks like you and, and many others around the country are you know you're not you're not emergency disaster planners yet you're like figuring it out as you go with based on principles and that's I'm sure Phil would agree that's kind of what we need to do is base decisions on principles of safety, protection, et cetera, uh, known risks, you know, because it's not risk-free, but given the risk, um, even to your family, for instance, I mean, you, you're judging this as you go along. So, so I think maybe we need to really get prepared for some of these contingencies down the road, but anyone maybe on the call who might have a thought on this, uh, you know, would you accept a patient who was recovering from COVID or had recovered, had a little certificate said, I'm clear? What, what do you do? Will they be stigmatized? Anybody have any I, I, just, I have a question. It's like a comment slash question. For those of us that are primarily MSK therapists and maybe haven't really done a whole lot in the cardio rest world other than thoracic mobility, um, thoracic dysfunction, I'm just wondering what um, specifically our role would or could be for those who are recovering from COVID. I understand there will be a role for us, for the general public who may have been sitting on their arses for three months and doing nothing and, you know, getting all those people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and all that kind of stuff back to where they maybe were pre, pre-pandemic. But I'm just wondering, um, like, as, like, not really having much cardio rest skills, like, so the, the whole concept of the clinic that Sandy has going on is is great in the sense that they have all those precautions already set up, but for the actual COVID patients who are recovering from that, that lung disease, that respiratory c condition, I'm just not sure where, as the MSK therapists, we fit into that population. Diana, that's a layup for you. Yeah, I was gonna okay. say, Diana is cringing. <laughs> just um, wait for, for it. First of all, here's, here's my opinion. In my opinion, there is no such thing as a musculoskeletal physiotherapist. Every single one of us deals with blood vessels, hearts, and lungs every day of our career. We just forget that we do. So your, your very basic skills, which sits somewhere in your MSCPT note somewhere, um, are available. 
what we know and what we've seen even from our earliest placements are that we have a greater understanding than um, our other colleagues who might be say chiropractors, kinesiologists and so on. Um, and that we have this rare opportunity now to pull all that together and say, okay, how do we do this? You also have mentors everywhere. So we have a cardiorespiratory division and um, you know, you've got these people right across the country who are saying, come. So you're, where are you, Jenny? You're in? I'm in North Vancouver. Yeah. So in North Vancouver. So, you know, you get in touch with Pat Camp or you get in touch with, you know, um, Simon Grunig or any of those folks and you just sort of say, hey, like, um, and right now, um, courses for doing just what you're talking about to make, um, make it a little bit easier to make that jump for people who haven't done it in a while are happening. And so online Physiopedia um, has put up some information to help. And there are some guidelines that have come out today um, from the international group and uh, Michelle Co and ICCRPT and so on. So this information is just sort of starting to go kablooey. And I just noticed um, Phil online, um, phil.shepherd at, give me the, give me the website, Phil. Um, Phil-shepherd.com. Right. Um, you know, a lot of these links are there and yeah. up on the CPA website on the front page, even, you know, and especially for non-members, it's there. And, and so the idea is, what do we think we know to be true? You can say to somebody, let's prevent your ending up in the ER. How do we do that? Physical distancing and move it, move it, move it. All right. That's, that's what needs to happen. Let's say you start to get some symptoms. What do you need to do? Physical distancing to a greater degree, close the door you know, from your family and um, you know, take a look at the color of your mucus. Ask yourself if you're short of breath. What is shortness of breath? My son said, well, how do I know if I'm short of breath? <laughs> He's a millennial who's worried about being sick. And, and I said, you kind of are gonna know, but let me tell you, it'll probably feel like this, which is not like at the end of your job and so on. So we have all this information that's sitting inside us that's ready to go. Let's say they end up in the ER. What do we have to do? We have to try and prevent them ending up in a hospital bed so we can tell the closest ERs. We're out there in the community. And if you think you have somebody you'd like to send home that they don't have to be admitted, um, you know, give them our number or our email or our website and we'll get online with them and we'll say, here are some of the things that you need to do, right? And, um, you know, it, even as simple as, um, you know, how do we wash our hands? Nobody does it correctly. Are you getting both thumbs? Are you getting between the fingers? Are your nails in the bed of your palm of your hand? And are you going up to mid forearm instead of only up to where your watch is and so on? There's so much we have to offer, it's incredible. Um, do you have to do all your PPE and get into the ICU and suction somebody right now? No, you don't. But you need to take the load off those guys who do have to do that, right? So I think the information is out there. I think it's readily available. I think it's scary as hell for somebody who, like you has said, you know, I haven't done it for a long time maybe. But um, we are really ready and poised to do this. And, and you can. So it sounds like you think that someone who hasn't done it since placement, should they go online and read some resources and maybe take some physiopedia courses that should be sufficient? And because we don't even really know what these peop, these COVID recoveries are really looking like or really need yet. Well, I'll give Correct you me I'll, um, let me jump in. The, the excellent points, and this is reminding me a little bit that one thing we haven't thought much about is that question of, okay, so let's fast forward a few months, and now you're at the interface with patients who've recovered, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of stigma. I'm sure there'll be unclarity, and so, so that, Phil and I will take that and think about that and see if we can maybe talk to CPA or others or maybe do it ourselves probably is best. To, to come up with like a plan there to have some information. But 
what you just said, Jenny. Uh, so Phil and I are creating this boot camp, uh, and Diana's going to be involved. Like, how can you do anything without Diana? I mean, she's awesome. So, so she'll be involved, and it'll be like a, a five to ten hour of, uh, series of events that'll be posted on the, the websites that you know of the PT COVID nineteen. Uh, and then it'll be open to everyone. We're, everyone in the States who goes on this um, our roster will have to take it in order to be linked. It's going to be a criteria for being linked with a demand side factor or site. So we're hoping that, well, maybe this will be something that, you know, people like yourselves or others might be interested in taking too. It's not a huge investment, but it's an initial investment. And then there's some other resources that will be built over time so that you can, if for instance, you are for some reason requested to go, I don't think it'll happen, but you requested to go and do suctioning, well, there'll be additional modules. So I think this is a moment in time where we have to say, all right, well, we don't really know, but there are principles, like Diana just said, we have, there are principles that should guide what we do next. And, you know, we said this the first time, and, and for sure, uh, there's Sean out there. I mean, in time, moments of, of emergencies, it's the time to bring it down, be driven by goals, be driven by values, and be driven by what we need to do, get through it, and then we recover. Uh, so so you, you brought up some really good points there, Jenny. We'll, Phil and I will take it to heart and then see what we can intervene at. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. And so is that um, happening in Canada, this list of people? That's a great question. <clears throat> it, um, it looks like, uh, so we're actually, we're going to be rolling this out in the U.S. with APTA in the next couple of days. And we just had a good online session about it with uh, APTA, um, where they're actually rolling this out. So they'll recruit physios, train them with this boot camp, and then connect them to acute care centers. That uh, was in the works in, in Canada. And now it looks like the regulatory bodies are taking that on. So, and one of the things that, we're, we want to make sure that is available to Canadian physiotherapists is that people are trained. Cause like you were saying, it's, um, you know, for someone who primarily works in private practice or in an MSK setting to go into a hospital, even if it's not working in acute care, but just to be able to protect themselves, protect the patients and frankly, protect the entire profession within Canada, people need to be well-trained. And that's one of the things that we're, we're working on, and we'll see if we can share that with the resources we develop for the APTA. But if people are signing up for these to be deployed through the ministry, then I would highly encourage that you uh, receive some training and push for that type of training. So can I ask a question? Um, Jenny, did you receive anything? So in Ontario, the college... A physiotherapist of Ontario sent something out to 100% of their members, the regulatory body, and said, you know, are you ready, willing, and able to jump in? And so you could put in your information, you could say whether or not you had done anything in the past 50 years, what you had done, what you feel like you're capable of right now, um, and what, what you might be willing to be trained for, and so on. So that went in, and just today, and right now I can only do tele-rehab. I can't do uh, hands-on right now. Um, and something came in today, dear Diana hopkins Rossio from the Ontario Health Force or Health Force Ontario saying, sign this consent form and you'll be on you know, our roster if we need you. And we understand that that's happening with all the regulatory bodies across Canada. So if that comes in, what, what I think is happening though is it's not... Um, it's what they're doing with doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists, uh, social worker psychologists as well, and so on. But what it isn't is a database of physiotherapists right across the country, like they're talking about with APTA, where they say, okay, now we know who you are as your professional association, and we're going to help you all have a baseline. So you all feel comfortable and the association feels comfortable that everybody does get that piece that you're asking about jenny so so there's a, a bit of a difference there yeah i was forwarded some of those um calls to action the ones that are circulating in ontario and as of today that hasn't happened in bc um i have reached out i actually called my um uh 
um, MP and uh, like I got through to them and they were able to put me in touch with people from the various health authorities and so I've kind of been circulating the list of people that I've compiled but it hasn't come at least from the College of Physios I don't know if the, the other like mm. the other allied health professions have received mm. that sort of call but it hasn't happened in BC so um, it's yeah it's disjointed and disappointing yeah. is it, so it's you, great uh, to have Mike and and uh, great to have Mike and Phil well I just yeah uh, before you jump in Mike I just want to say that Jen I have been um, uh, cr contacting and going back and forth with Jenny. She's actually rolling something out in North Van. All right. Yeah. yeah. But I know you have a lot to say, so go for it. Yeah. Well, listen, my cortisol level is getting high again after listening to that because we were, we, we were under the assumption that across Canada, all the regulatory bodies were doing this. And we, as Phil and Mike, it's actually one word now, Phil and Mike. It's like a, it's like a word. It's not a Phil and Mike. <laughs> Phil and Mike. So that we didn't like do anything, but we, I didn't, I thought all provinces were doing, is there anyone else on the call from a different province than Ontario and BC that know about whether the regulatory authority has reached out to you? Um, sorry, just coming on here. Hi, it's Allison. Um, I'm in Alberta right now. And so far that hasn't happened either. Um, that being, that being said, just from the baseline perspective, I'm wondering how that does work with the health authorities, because I work with the health authority. Um, and I'm just thinking like your usual training when you come on as a casual or a staff member at the hospital, you do undergo specific training, I suppose, especially for the ICU, let's say. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, I know this is different. This is an urgent situation. And when, when things get to be um, worse than they are right now, kind of what that looks like so they probably wouldn't be as um yeah they wouldn't they might not be as what's the word i'm looking for <laughs> they might not care quite as much um and just be happy to have people that are helping and trained to an extent but yeah i'm just how kind of wondering how that works with the health authorities and how and who's kind of doing that that liaison with the health authorities cpa uh or the the, the provincial branches we have no idea. Uh, so when you say that, you know, the, the, the moment of like, it's going to be anybody's good enough will happen. And then we'll all think back saying, well, we should have had a training session and that's what we wanted to do. So, so, uh, okay. So we got BC, Alberta hasn't done it. Let's keep going. Any, any, who, anyone from like Saskatchewan or the Maritime provinces? No. Krista. Oh no, that you're you're in BC. Uh, no news from Quebec. We said, oh, fanta. Okay, there no, no news from. Uh, okay, well, okay, so maybe it's not being rolled out nationwide. Maybe it's only in Ontario. So that's good. That's good intel uh, for us. Things also might just be happening a bit slower. Like I know. Yeah, I know a couple of the BC and Alberta, even the initial kind of releases that they sent out were a bit behind potentially some of the other ones. So um, yeah, it could just be a little bit slower. I think it's a good idea to uptrain um, private practice physios um, in, yeah, in this time. My, my other question though is kind of what is being done more at a government level for kind of looking at that longer term. Like here in Alberta, or sorry, here in Calgary, one of the pulmonary rehab centers actually was just closed down in this event um, because their patient population is so high risk. However, looking forward, you need to consider that that pulmonary rehab facility actually needs to be better funded and improved um, so that they can help to deal with the COVID population. Same with if they're having cardiac issues or the cardiac rehab program. So cardiac rehab and, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, cardiac rehab and pulmonary rehab facilities, at least within Alberta, but I believe within BC too, those are the only two places I've ever worked, um, tend to be few and far between and tend to have very high um, inclusion exclusion criteria. Like they only see a very small portion of people. Um, so I think like, yeah, I think for an and from an advocacy, advocacy perspective, that's something that really needs to be considered um, as well. I know here there's been recent stories of like even just people who've because I mean, influenza A and B and whatnot can be a similar situation as well, but just not to the extent that COVID's happening. And there's people that leave the ICU or other significant acute care stays um, after having influenza 
that then don't get sufficient rehabilitation in the community because they don't qualify for the pulmonary rehab programs, which are primarily for post-surgical people, um, and there's nobody in the community who knows how to deal with those kind of conditions. Yeah, Allison, you're yeah. bang on there. I mean, seriously, that, that's that's the the scary. The, the, what you've described is like the Sunday afternoon version of what might happen here uh, with with what's coming, and so. Um, you know, we don't know. And so we need probably just, if you look, think about theory of advocacy is, you know, you need the advocacy happening at the national, provincial, local, you know, we need to be all kind of uh, cross pollinating here, but, um, yeah. uh, but, but hey, listen, it, it's uh, 544 and, um, you know, we, Phil and I are always trying to preserve people's times as much as possible. And um, so maybe we can stay on a little bit, but before we go, I saw a few people are, are starting to move on, which is fine. Uh, Sandy, let, let maybe we'll just say a super thanks to you for sharing your story of what's going on. Um, uh, keep us informed, we'll be reaching out. You know, let's see how your clinic and your own thought pattern is emerging over time as things change. But, but thanks for your efforts and certainly thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandy. We really appreciate it. And uh, you're definitely leading in this time of uncertainty with no guidance from really anyone. So we really. Thank you. Take us home, Phil. Uh, I can't, can't hear Phil anymore. Can't hear you, Phil. Okay, well, well, Phil attempts uh, a, a resurgence. How are we doing? There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we're back. So, um, yeah, so we'll end it there. The uh, there is going to be a session. Did you hear the part where I thank Sandy for being awesome? At least. Let's do it again. Why not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I was just saying thank you to Sandy for really leading in this time and with no guidance. And so, and thank you for coming on and speaking with us and sharing your experience. The next session that we'll have is on Sunday at four. So we're actually gonna do these. So Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. The one on Sunday should be absolutely amazing. There's a group of physiotherapists in uh, Halifax who have been working in COVID-19 assessment centers. And the, um, the practice lead on that, Michael, has been actually going through and went through all the legislation and found out that this actually falls within our scope and uh, worked to lobby to get us in there. So he's going to talk about that. And then the next one after that looks like it'll be Tuesday at four with Pete Skelton, who's the head of the UK's emergency medical team. And we'll keep going from there. So thank you. I'm willing to stay on for a few minutes and chat a little bit more, but we'll end the actual discussion um, with Sandy here. Thanks everyone. All yeah. right, now that that's, um, oh, go ahead, Mike. No, I just, thanks for joining everybody. And nice, uh, nice job, Sandy. And um, lots of stuff to pick up from here. I'm, as as this, the last few minutes, I'm, I'm sending a message to inquire about what's going on with the rostering in uh, Alberta and British Columbia. Um, so uh, we'll follow up and post some information. Yeah. Yeah, any, any uh, discussion points or questions? We can keep you on for a bit. If not, then we'll sign off. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Good night. Okay, have a good night. See ya.